Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are, coaches. I'm Monique Bowman, Communications Manager and today's moderator. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's Hangout. Uh, today is the first of a three-part Hangout series with our esteemed panelists, and he will be discussing the physical demands of the athlete and, in today's case, rest to work, the rest-to-work correlation. So with us today is Dr. John Gallucci. Hello. How are you? Good, thank how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Uh, he is the MLS coordinator, or medical coordinator, and president of JAG Physical Therapy. So we thank him for taking the time to speak with us today. As a reminder, I'm not sure if you've um, watched our, our hangouts before, but if you have questions during our conversation, you can send them in one of two ways. The first is tweet them to us to at NSCAA using the NSCAA Philly hashtag or you can email them to marketing at nscaa.com. So, Dr. Gallucci, let's start with um, a little bit about your background. So for viewers who may not be familiar with what, uh, what you do, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and then also a little bit about the work you do with um, MLS? Sure, so uh, by license, I'm a physical therapist and a certified athletic trainer. I'm dual degreed and dual licensed throughout the country. I have a doctorate in physical therapy. I've been involved in professional sports and sports for over 25 years, taking care of athletes at all different levels, from uh, the wee guys of four, five, six years old in development to our professional athletes and keeping them on the field and keeping them safe and, health and healthy. Um, I own 11 outpatient orthopedic physical therapy centers, but also I am the medical coordinator with Major League Soccer, assisting our medical director, Dr. Larry Lemack, in basically the progression and uh, the following of our policies and procedures throughout the league when it comes to the care of our more than 600 athletes. Okay, thank you very much for that. So yeah, kind sure. of jumping into today's like conversation for our coaches, what are some of the key physical milestones um, in an athlete's development that coaches need to be aware of? Well, the biggest issue, especially when you're in the youth leagues and you're dealing with basically the introduction of the game, is to understand the different levels of not only the component of fitness, but also uh, growth, psychological implications, social implications. And a lot of people don't, when they're, when they're teaching any game, not, not just soccer, they don't look into what really the development stage of where the child's at. So a lot of people will try to train an 8-year-old in the same way they're training a 16-year-old or try to train a 20-year-old the way they're trying to train a 14-year-old. There's an understanding of the different levels of sport, the different levels of the child's cognitive skills versus their fine and gross motor skills and also where they are socially and psychologically. So as coaches, we need to understand that we're teachers and we're, we're basically molding these individuals into, in our world, great soccer players, but pretty much we're molding them into, into people that can play the sport effectively, understand the rules of the game, and also understand the ways to train themselves for the game. One of the biggest factors that we try to do is we try to teach coaches the different levels of conditioning and the different levels of motivating their athletes. So when you're looking at that 6 to 11, 12-year-old age, really it's an introduction to the game. It's an introduction to the rules of the game. It needs to be fun. It needs to be social. It needs to be engaging to keep the child's interest. A lot of times we see children at this age being either uh, turned down or away or discouraged from performing because they feel that they, they're, they're being ostracized uh, by the coach or by the parent on the sidelines when really if we look at these children, that's a time that we're supposed to be teaching them to enjoy the sport, understand the social impact, understand the psychological impact, and grow from there. When we go from the 12 years old to really the 16 year old, that's when we could take our training a little bit more intensity. We should be actually playing more games because the children should know the rules, really getting their feet under them, making sure their legs are under them, really concentrating your practice and breaking up your practice really into about thirds, which is really a concept of fitness, the concept of, of education, and a concept of training, and, and really being able to break it. Also at this age, you can hold the attention span a little bit longer. When you're talking about the wee guys under 12 years old, you really got an attention span of maybe 30 minutes. So your practice should really only be 45 minutes to an hour. When you look at the 12 to 16 year old, you can really get away with an hour and a half practice. 
if you as the coach think that you're going to go longer than that, especially on a teaching component, you know, we've already read all the studies, especially that come out of Michigan State, and basically the child at that age's attention is not going to be focused. Uh, so really you want to do your practice about an hour and a half. Yes, you can add a fitness component to it that might be a little bit longer, but as far as your teaching and playing, you don't want to beat these kids down every single day. Then we jump above 16 years old, and really we're looking at grown men and women now, 16 and up. They really only have one or two more growth spurts to go. You have to understand the dynamic of that their musculoskeletal system is now a true form structure that you have to understand that that needs to be taken care of. So there needs to be a true level of development of fitness and conditioning and flexibility that needs to be encompassed in any training regimen. These athletes, again, can handle a practice about two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. And again, as coaches, our goal is to keep them focused. You don't want players not focused during your practices because ultimately you can't get the whole group to work as a team if one or two individuals don't have the attention span to handle it. And ultimately what you're trying to do at this level too is teach them the concept of taking care of themselves and teach them how to prevent their own injuries. And if we look at soft tissue injuries around our country, they make up close to 50% of injuries that are going to emergency rooms. And we can simplistically teach our children at all ages the importance of hydration, the importance of conditioning, which we'll get into. But ultimately, the goal is, is to make sure at all three of those levels that the child is truly being developed that we want. So it's not just about soccer skills. It's about really developing the entire athlete. And I hate to use this anecdote because it's used all the time. Just because a child that's seven, eight years old does not have the gross and fine motor skills to be Pele right off the bat doesn't mean when they're 14 to 16 years old, they're not going to have some great skills that can be developed. So it's important that we need to keep children involved. You know, I'm not a big fan of our cutting system, but I know that's a big debate. I think we need to have levels to develop children at all ages and make sure that we're not losing children from the game and keeping them involved. Okay. Now, you a uh, couple of uh, tidbits. There's a lot of tidbits in there, but one thing I do want to touch on a little bit is um, you talk about um, attention span. So with the, in the age of technology, when kids are on Facebook and YouTube, you know, on social media, and they, their attention spans are maybe getting even shorter, how do coaches do? You, coaches need to adjust to that, or are we have do we have to teach our kids to maybe focus a little bit longer? Does that oh, affect? That, that's a fantastic, fantastic question. And you know, the the biggest thing that we're learning, especially that we deal with our neuropsychologists a lot, things like that, is making things engaging. Uh, making things, first of all, we live in a social media empire right now. Look at this. <laughs> you've, got me, you've got me across the nation right now. I mean, who, who would have thought? But ultimately, we have to understand that it needs to be engaging. And there's actually a lot of different things coming out in reference to engaging your athletes. So again, when you're talking about the educational segment, it should be quick, effective, efficient, and you should be able to be able to replicate it to get muscle memory to replicate it. When you're talking about soccer, we know it's an aerobic, a very aerobic sport. We need to make sure that we're getting their endurance up. So when you're doing that type of training, the best way to get an athlete's endurance up is actually to play the game. And a lot of coaches sometimes are not big fans of letting the game develop at practice. To me, I think one of the most important factors, especially above the age of 16 years old, is putting them in game situations where you're actually going. Just remember, we've all learned if you train hard in practice, the game is actually easy because <laughs> you're conditioned and ready to go. So that's something that we try to really do. Also, there's a great software that just came out. It's a great digital mobile application that coaches get to talk to their children, their players all the time able to put them through fitness programs, able to talk to them about tidbits of nutrition. So it's a way the coach now, let's say you're in charge of a recreation team and you're only going to see these kids three times a week, two practices during the week and then that one game day or one tournament game day. There's this application now called At Peak that's unbelievable. I have coaches using it all over the place and it's been fantastic where coaches are actually communicating with their kids every single day. It could be a, a, a a, a two or three sentence 
thing about nutrition or hydration, or it can be a full exercise video component that the coach wants the children to follow to prevent injuries. And it's, they do flexibility, they do strengthening, and they curtail it to individual ages. So the three segments that I just spoke about, they actually make programs as long as 20 to 30 minutes or as efficient as 10 to 15 minutes. And that application is really gaining a tremendous amount of speed. So I really see that starting to take off in the next couple of, couple of years where coaches are going to be socially integrated with their mm -hmm. players all week long. Again, and it's not that you're, you're there 24-7, but you have the opportunity one time a day to touch your player. I'm sure there's every coach that's listening to us right now that would love the opportunity the day after practice if they're not seeing these kids say, oh, I should have showed Johnny this. Oh, Steven should know that. This is going to give people this whole technological revolution that we're living in is going to give coaches such a better edge on working with their children, teaching their players, but also the biggest thing, which is my, my huge gold standard, keeping kids safe and injury-free and on the field playing. Absolutely. So for younger players, uh, some coaches and parents may push their athlete. Um, maybe it's you know a lot, maybe it's a little, just to, a lot of people talk about the mental toughness piece. We'll get to that maybe later. So what are some of the warning signs that uh, coaches and parents should be cognizant of, of physical fatigue, and how to maybe combat that? Again, it's another great question. I've spoken all over the world actually on this from Italy to America to Chicago to Los Angeles. And really what it is, is is keeping the children interested. And, you know, a lot of times if we look again at the studies that came out of Michigan and we look at the population of children that drop out of sport before 13 years old, mm -hmm. and you look at the top four reasons why they dropped out of sport. And it's amazing that the top two are parents, push them too hard, or coaches push them too hard, and then number three is really injury, and then number four is as they're getting older and becoming teenagers, it becomes time-consuming. Mm -hmm. I think we as coaches really have to put an emphasis, especially in America, if we're going to start to really compete at the world stage, we need to start to develop our youth tremendously. And the only way we can develop them is to really keep their interest. So practices need to be engaging. Coaches need to be positive and really understand the development component and what age group they're dealing with and try not to shun kids or put kids uh, separated from the group, but really try to keep it group-oriented so it's a social component and also teach the fitness component. So you asked about the signs and symptoms of a child that's that basically uh, is, is getting to that point that either mom or dad or the coach or, or whatever it may be that's pushing them away from the sport, basically is they disengage. When you have a child at practice that really is not paying attention to the coach or the assistant coaches or not paying attention to what's going on, that disengagement right off the bat should be a cue to the coach and the parent that this child really is no longer having a good time is no longer conditioning the way they have to. And usually what happens is they sustain an injury. That now um, unfortunately doubles our issue that they were disengaging beforehand. Now they're going to be away from the team to rehabilitate. Now it's up to the coach to try to get that child back and integrate with the physical therapist or the certified athletic trainer to keep that child involved with the team. I mean, I remember in the old days, a kid get hurt, the doctor would say, hey, listen, don't go for six weeks. You know what? Those kids have to be involved. They need to be on the sidelines with their team. They need to be part of the fun. You know, the other thing is, is and again, not to correlate it with soccer, but I was a very, I was a very good wrestling coach. I was a wrestler as well. And one of the biggest things that we did was we took a program of 25 children at my alma mater, and we were able to bring it to a program of 78 to 80 children a year involved. And one of the biggest reasons why our program grew, and, and that was the 14 to 18-year-old group. The reason why that grew so well was parents and the children loved the social atmosphere that the coach, which was me at the time, would actually take a day and say, you know what, let's go grab a slice of pizza. Let's go to the movies. You know, let's break it up a little bit. You know, every day, soccer, 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 wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. Every day, it's nice to just hang out with your peers and and basically just be able to chat it up a little bit, maybe even go watch a soccer game, bring them to one of the MLS games, sit them in front of television. You know, one big thing that my daughter's soccer coach did, which I thought was great in her college years, was once a week, 
I, and I know coaches aren't going to like this, but <laughs> once a week she would actually only have a 30-minute practice. And her practice was really playing, uh, you know, like a soccer tag or soccer pong or something, you know, soccer tennis, just to get the kids to loosen up. And then she'd sit them down for 45 minutes to watch video. And what she did at the end of every video session, so she did a half hour of that video and then took 15 minutes of the women's national team excerpts. And those kids every week would come back the next day so motivated, so focused, so engaged to train, to run, to do fitness, to play, that that's the best way we've got to keep these kids engaged. I mean, the statistic nationally is more than 70% of children drop out before the age of 13 for those top four reasons I gave you. You know, we're teachers, we're coaches. We have to develop these kids. Yes, when you get to the older ages, it does become more specific on success, on developing success and understanding success. But if you're under the age of 14, we need to make it about the children. It needs to be about fun. It needs to be about fitness. It needs to be about social. Okay. All excellent. Again, excellent points. Thank you for that. Thanks. So, so for those who might not be familiar for, with the um, work to rest ratio, um, simply put, what is it? And um, well, you let's know, just it, go with that. <laughs> it's 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 a big word. <laughs> that everybody is throwing out in all athletics. But we've all really learned about it when we took our biology classes or our fitness classes or health classes in, in high school. We learned about anaerobic and aerobic training. Mm -hmm. And we learned about what are the importance of anaerobic versus aerobic. And with our sport, of course, aerobic is a huge component of it. And really what they've done now is they've taken this this big concept and now they've said, oh, we've got a work to rest ratio. We've got a work to rest ratio. Well, really what we're doing is we're looking about the intensity of the body. We're looking about what activity the body is doing and we're really giving a rest period in between before that body moves forward. And we're making these ratio statistics of, all right, if we're doing a, a aerobic component, your ratio of the aerobic component to the rest component could be a two to one ratio. So what does that mean? If we're doing an aerobic component for two minutes, the rest component needs to be a minute. Now when we look at the anaerobic component, which is a stress component on the musculoskeletal system, it's a resistant component on the musculoskeletal system, it's a component that lactic acid is being built in the musculature, and there needs to be a healing phase. Well, just as, again, we learned in high school when, the, when we went to the strength coach who was teaching us how to lift weights, and he used to make us do a certain amount of repetitions and then told us you need to rest for this amount of time for those repetitions. Well, it's the same thing. It's taking the anaerobic strength component that's basically getting a component of resistance to get the musculoskeletal system to fire. Basically, there needs to be a longer rest time. So when you look at the rest ratio there, it should really be a four or a five to one ratio again. So again, so if we're doing a, a, a resistance training for, for one minute, you need to say to yourself there needs to be a rest period of four minutes. Again, to give the body an opportunity to get circulation going, to get things going. And really, they made it very difficult, and I want to make it as simple as possible for the listeners. Now, I know we have a scope of coaches on the line from, from the young guys all the way up to the professionals, but ultimately, this component, when you're really looking at the high school kids, the, the, the recreation, the club players, the academy players that don't have strength and conditioning coaches with them that are taking it on an individual basis, really that's all it means. It's really what we learned about aerobic and anaerobic training, and everybody has made it like this brand new philosophy. This philosophy has been around way before I was practicing, and I'm practicing for 25 years. Now, of course, when you get to the college and, and professional setting, there's a strength coach, there's a sports scientist that are taking these athletes individually. They're looking at their weaknesses. They're looking at their biomechanical differences. They're looking at their aerobic thresholds. We don't have that in the lower ranks. So the easiest way to do it is with these rest ratios. But again, we have to understand soccer is an aerobic sport. We need to make sure that coaches understand there needs to be an aerobic component in your training. 
in your off season. Aerobic threshold is very, very important. Now, we're not sending a bunch of 12 year olds to go all get their aerobic threshold and oxygen consumption rates <laughs> at all the local labs. You know, first of all, we can't afford it. We're lucky we can afford the balls and the cones on the field. Yeah. So, <laughs> to be able to send somebody for a $300 oxygen consumption test makes no sense. So, the simplest way to do it is really work within the realm and understand that we are an aerobic sport, but strength is important. You know, one of the biggest things, and I'm going to just segue for a second for the coaches. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things coaches have to understand is the best way to reduce injuries. We talked about hydration, but you really need to have a great core development, and you should really emphasize that starting from the young guys all the way up so it's in integrated throughout their entire athletic career that there's core development. And, and just to sidetrack a little bit more, the biggest reasons why in America we have back issues, low back issues, which our government has staggering billion dollar expenditures, is because we've never taught people how to core develop. And if you look at athletes and you look at a sustained leg injury or a throwing athletes, a sustained shoulder injury, if we had a good developed core and good biomechanics, we could prevent those injuries. So soccer is a rotational running sport. We need to make sure that there's a component of core development. And those of you that don't understand core, it's not just your anterior abdominals. It's your lower back. It's your trunk. You need to understand all of that. Not just about doing a thousand crunches. <laughs> wow, that would be a lot. Um, so this question was submitted from Andre Liza uh, from Shattuck St. Mary's. How do you account for individual genetic differences and workload capacity or recovery abilities in players, and what implications does that have on training and or performance? Andre, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, genetics and athletics have been involved for years. You know, uh, can we take a blood test of a child that's six years old and see if they're going to make it to the Olympics? Uh, the mm -hmm. Germans have done great studies with that. The Ukrainians have done great studies. We in America, Italy, you know, can you really take a genetic workup and say this child is going to be better in, in an aerobic sport versus an anaerobic? Are they going to be a better soccer player versus, better, versus a better baseball player? You know, honestly, when we look at the level of people that we're speaking to uh, right now, I'm assuming the majority are college, high school, recreation, development, and academy coaches. I don't know if we have a tremendous amount of high professional coaches, but I'm sure the professional coaches will tell you straight out that the best developed athletes out there are the ones that are the most well-rounded. Uh, the ones that really understand that soccer is just not a one-directional sport, it's a multi-directional sport. The coaches that really understand that nutrition, hydration, strength and conditioning, aerobic conditioning, and multi-plane training is the most important thing. Can we take a blood test and basically say this child is going to be better than their other? You know, again, not to, not to beat up Michael Jordan, but he was told at 13 years old he'd never make it. I think he proved those people wrong. Now, do I think he had a genetic study done? No, I don't think back in the, in the 70s they were doing genetic studies. But I think, again, I think we need to give the children the opportunity to grow and develop. I think the biggest mistake that we make at, at all levels is uh, at all levels of athletics and youth sports is when we take a child under 14 years old and tell them they're not good enough. Uh, you know what? They may not be good enough for the select team, but the coach, if they're really a coach in, uh, that understands education and development, that coach that's telling a child that they may not be up to par yet, if they're really doing a coaching job and developing that child, they need to find an area where they're going to be developed. You know, a lot of people like to say, oh, we just cut them. There's a lot of kids in a lot of academies that have been cut that I know are playing Division One soccer now at a high level, and I know they're coming into the – the combine every year with me in Major League Soccer. And I love speaking with these guys and saying, hey, at 13 years old, did you ever think you'd make it to my MLS combine and have an opportunity to be drafted by Major League Soccer? And usually you'll get a handful of guys that will say, what are you talking about? I got cut from my high school team. I was <laughs> cut from my, my recreation team. You know, if anything, it gave me more confidence to go back and try harder. 
But, I mean, they cut me because I couldn't pass the ball in one direction or another. At eight years old, I was told I couldn't do that. But I really enjoyed the game of soccer, and I, and I honed in on my gross motor skills. So it's great to hear these young guys that are jumping into the professional world tell you their experiences <laughs> that they were cut at eight, nine, ten years old, and here they are being drafted into the Major League Soccer. So I think it's great, and I think we as coaches have to understand there always needs to be a development component. And as I said, I understand above 16 years old, there needs to be the component of winning strategies and success, and I agree to develop, again, the next level of the game. But if we really want soccer to advance in America, I think we really need to see the component of Logical components integrated in the 14 and other craft. Right. Now, you did bring up um, MLS, you know, your work with the MLS. So, kind of um, getting into that, um, we have an idea of what the physical demands are, but um, what can you kind of explain what, what um, that kind of goes into and what these uh, rest to work ratios look like at that level? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, the amazing thing about Major League Soccer is we got a great compilation of medical professionals throughout the league uh, that are credentialed through Major League Soccer's office. And, and what it's fantastic about is, is the communication with the coaches and the communication with the staffs are unbelievable that our players are truly getting developed the right way. Um, and when you look at the component of the demands, a lot of coaches take a step back and say, okay, what do I have to do to get my child or get my athlete ready for their 80 or 90 minute game on Saturday? And what we've been able to do is teach our coaches, teach our strength and conditioning coaches an understanding that it's not just about the 90 minute game. It's about, and you, you were talking about the professional level, it's about the travel. It's mm -hmm. about the nutrition. It's about the rest component of fatigue factors when traveling. So there's so many different factors that go into, you know, I always get a kick out of our youth tournaments. And, and again, my daughter now plays soccer in college uh, at the Division three level, and she's gone through the entire rec program to the club program to the academy program. And it always amazes me that a coach is preparing a team to play 90 minutes, but yet we'll go to a weekend tournament and we'll play uh, six games that are 45 minutes each, back to back to back over two days. Mm -hmm. Honestly, your best players may not be fit enough to handle that. Or when you're traveling in a car for four hours and get out of the car, are you warmed up and ready to go? It also amazes me coaches at halftime. That I mean, every professional game, you see players at halftime on the field warming themselves up, getting a sweat going, getting their aerobic threshold up, making sure they're ready to go, ready to enter the game. It amazes me at the youngest levels all the way to the highest levels that we don't have children during the halftime doing anything. Sitting on the floor does not prepare them for the first 15 minutes. No matter what philosophy, Coach, that you're using, sitting on the floor for 15 minutes does not get them ready for the second half of the game. Now, you talked about the, the work-to-rest ratio at the professional level. You have to realize we have such tools between, again, oxygen consumption tools, between the, the utilization of my coach, which is looking at data that's collected during practice and games and looking at the statistics of how the aerobic threshold and how the cardio cardiological component comes in, which we don't have throughout the country as far as the different levels. So when you look at all work-to-rest ra ratios, our coaches and statisticians and our, 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 our sports scientists are really making that very individualized for each player to get the most out of the workout. I remember when I first went into Major League Soccer back in 1998, meeting with the strength and conditioning coach of that time, it was the Metro Stars, which is now Red Bull. I remember it was his first day on the job, and he was very, very nervous, and he took the team out, and he brought them through a warm-up, and the coach put them through practice, and then he brought them through a, a little conditioning session afterwards. And he came over to me and he said, what did, you, what did you think? And I said, that was a great physical education workout. Professional athletes, do you know anything about your players? Do you know where your players feel their weaknesses are? Do you know where your players feel they need strength? Do you know where your players' aerobic threshold are? And he looked at me like, well, that's the most insulting thing you could possibly tell me that I just did my first session, and it looked like a phys ed class, professional level. 
You're about dealing with individuals. Yes. Yes, it's a team sport, but each individual has to get to their fitness level, has to get to their strength level, and has to get themselves to the best possible condition that they believe they need to get to. And he learned from that, and he ended up staying in Major League Soccer for a few years. But ultimately, the strength and conditioning coaches and the sports scientists, sports all over, are those guys that individually train their athletes. Now, as we know, a one coach on a Saturday morning in a 14-year-old level can definitively not take it, but there's so many great guidelines and books out there on conditioning and training. My book, Soccer Injury Prevention and Treatment, talks about the different levels of preventing injury, the most common injuries, what direction to turn, some simple guidelines of hydration, some simple guidelines of, of nutrition, but most importantly, especially those of you training female athletes, we discuss our lower extremity strengthening system, which is not just about the anterior cruciate ligament, but it's about all lower extremity injuries and how to keep all of our athletes on the pitch and out of the emergency room. So, you know, it, it's a great guide, but there's some great conditioning guides out there for coaches that have 14 to 16 year olds. And again, it's funny. I had a conversation earlier today, and I was just had the opportunity to represent uh, MLS at the Soccer X in Barbados. I just flew back actually last night with a great audience of administrators and coaches and people from around the world. Some federations were represented. And it amazes me that I was talking to a coach uh, who was a physician, that his son is five years old, and he's been covering soccer now for 10 years. And he knows the medical ins and outs in soccer, but his five-year-old, his wife signed him up to coach the five-year-old soccer program. And he went and bought a book. And the first page of the book is, make sure they have fun. So the bottom line is, is we got the little guys. We've got to keep them engaged. It's got to be interested and it's got to be fun. Awesome. Thank you for that. And you did mention your book, um, Soccer Injury and Injury Prevention and Treatment, and for those watching on NSCA.com, we'll have a link um, after the live show is done, so you can go ahead and take a, a deeper look into uh, what you can expect there. A few more they questions. Should also, they should also understand and support your foundation. A portion of the book sales go towards the foundation as well. To the NSCA Foundation, that's awesome, which helps um, bring soccer coaching education to underprivileged and underserved communities. So we also want to ask you a couple more questions, and then we'll kind of um, wrap up. And this um, this comes from Steve Davis from New York Rush. Um, so his question is about um, so there some, seems to be some type of atmosphere of um, athletes not being forthtelling with um, their injuries, how maybe how severe or you know how they they're feeling because of pressure from coaches or pressure from peers or pressure from um, their parents. So um, Steve's question is, uh, what can we do as a coaching community to change the mentality of coaches and administrators who allow this type of conduct, conduct to continue, and how can we better educate players and parents uh, so they aren't afraid to say no um, if they can't go? So that's, that's a great question. I actually came up in Barbados at Soccer X, which was shocking because I, I was meeting with the uh, Barbadian uh, Soccer Alliance out there. And one of their biggest things is their infrastructure of medical for youth sports throughout the entire Caribbean nations. So it was pretty interesting that you bring that up because here in America, we have such a great infrastructure of medical uh, that other countries want to duplicate us, replicate us. But basically, children are fearful to say that they're hurt uh, for one reason or another. They don't want to disappoint their coach. They don't want to disappoint their, their team members. They don't want to dis disappoint their parents. Now, Steve, that's a great question in regards to let's talk about parents. So we can do an entire lecture in, in reference to parents and parents living vicariously through their children's athletic career and the, and the implications and demographics and how it, it's handled throughout our country. You know, who's trying to use sports to get a child into high school? Who's trying to use sports to get a child into college? Who's looking for the professional ticket? Who's looking for an avenue? And, you know, parents need to understand what sports were truly developed for. That development component was, again, a social, psychological, fitness component that integrates the understanding of teamwork, development, and teaches you skills for life. And really what we've been able to do, and although I do have another webinar with, 
with the organization uh, on January 16th with, with a, a comprehensive component of concussion. What concussion has taught us is educating parents, coaches, referees, league administrators to really get the message out on understanding what it is to be concussed. Well, to go back to your question, Steve, is we need to correlate and educate parents. There was a great program here, actually, in the Northeast, uh, held out of New Jersey, uh, the Barnabas Morahan Center for Athletic Assessment. They actually do an entire educational series, not for the children, but for the parents. And it's teaching the parents to understand what sports is about, not to live vicariously through them, making sure that it's an enriching environment. And ultimately, as I said, if we go back to our earlier conversation, it'll keep more children involved in athletics if we took the pressure off of the younger children. So parents really have to understand that they need to remove the pressure so children participate. I'd love to sit down with Michelle Obama one day when we're talking about the statistics of obesity and we say that 70% of children drop out of organized sports by the time they're 13. Imagine if we can captivate 15 to 20% of those children, how we can reduce the obesity statistics in America if we kept those children involved in doing things. Even my own children, you know, we all know the social aspect of Facebook and video games. I have a 10-year-old son that basically thinks that a video game is everything. He's a very high level, you know, for 10 years old, he's involved in fencing, he's involved in lacrosse, and, you know, we have a rule that he's not allowed to touch a television, he's not allowed to touch a computer unless he does some sort of kind of fitness every single day. So he has a 30, 20 to 30 minute routine that's carved out for him that he comes home from school, he has his cookies and milk or whatever it is, his nutritional snack, and before he does anything. We need to implement more and more of that, that the family's getting involved in athletics. The coaches need to make sure parents are educated. They understand when it's appropriate to talk to a coach, when it's not appropriate, and that's very easily done. There needs to be a 24-hour waiting period for coaches. And again, just as we're teaching parents, coaches, and referees about education and concussion, we need to teach them the same thing, the same strong principles about understanding where the parent plays the role when it comes to athletics. Okay. And another question sent in from Greg from Virginia. At what age should we begin agility training such as ladder work? It's a great question, Greg. You know, that, that question is asked very, very often. So, you know, when you're looking at agility work, we're really talking about what's called proprioceptive balance which is another component of strength. It works from your neurological system, goes all the way down to your feet. So when we talk about the younger ages, and we talk about developing those fine motor skills, so the child that maybe isn't up to par with the way he passes the ball, maybe he has, he's unbalanced when he runs, maybe when he backpedals, he doesn't look like the rest of the group. And coaches will say, oh, that, that kid's not good enough. Well, to be honest with you, to be able to do a proprioceptive act exercise, like preparing a child to do ladders, actually gives them good balance. So really, to start our children a little earlier, don't use it so much as a fitness tool. Use it as a development tool and really understand you're really trying to develop the gross motor skill of proprioceptive balance. So you basically take this concept of ladders and, and teaching them the understanding of balancing on a foot and hopping. You teach them the component of repetition. You're teaching them the component of weight shift and balance through weight shift. You're also teaching them a component of diagonal change. So I actually think that any level and any level of athletics, not just soccer, but any other sport, should definitively use it to teach a child balance. Now, again, I told you I was a wrestling coach. I've coached wrestling. Wrestling is all about balance. It's all about being able to maintain your center of gravity. And I've used tools like that and what we call perturbation training tools, which is basically taking an individual and knocking them off balance and seeing how they can basically bring themselves back. That's a strengthening technique. So I think it's important to be used through all levels of athletics. And I think it's it, there's never a young enough age if somebody is five years old and you want to try and increase their balance, maybe that child won't be dismissed from the team. Maybe if they have an opportunity over two weeks to get better balanced, 
You know, we do it all the time with children in physical therapy. A, a, a doctor will say, oh, the child keeps getting hurt because their lower extremities aren't strong enough. Not only are they not strong enough, they're just not balanced enough. You know, you see the kid that runs like an ostrich all off balance <laughs> or runs with his hips flailing left and right. Maybe it's a simple visit to get evaluated biomechanically, teach them some strengthening exercises, and get them going. We don't return athletes back to the field after injury until they're assessed. Well, if we've got a child that has a biomechanical deviation, let's assess them. Let's do a functional movement screen. You know, here at JAG Physical Therapy, we have a team of people that go out and do functional movement screens to the different clubs just to teach them different exercises. The children, not the coaches, teach the children, hey, you've got a hip weakness. Because of your hip weakness, it's predisposing you to a knee injury. If you strengthen mm -hmm. your hip, you're not going to have that knee injury. And it's a very simple test. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes. We go out to different clubs. Of course, the female clubs are definitely more into it because of decreasing lower extremity strength, uh, lower extremity injuries, uh, which are leg injuries. So it's important to understand all the different factors of understanding the balances, the balance and biomechanical train of the human body. If it's effectively working, it decreases injuries and keeps the people on the pitch, keeps the players on the pitch. So you brought up two, um, pretty much both of your um, uh, convention sessions um, over the course of this discussion, so I thank you for that. So um, for viewers out there, our 2015 convention is January 14th through the 18th, and Dr. Jamilucci is going to be there to uh, present. He has two sessions. So um, Dr. Gucci, would you tell us a little bit um, about your sessions and then what you hope um, coaches walk away from? Um, Yep. Well, first of all, the first one is a great comprehensive one for all levels of coaches to understand in the prevention of lower extremity injuries, which is the prevention of leg injuries, which as we know in soccer uh, is one of the biggest components that keeps players off the field. Uh, ankle injuries, knee injuries, hip injuries, groin injuries, lower back injuries. So what I hope to do in that session is really teach people the understanding of not only training for soccer, but training to prevent these types of injuries. First of all, is going to be a comprehensive component of understanding what are the most common injuries, how to treat them, how to effectively get people back, but more importantly, how to prevent them. And you guys are going to find, and there's a whole chapter in my book about hydration. It's amazing what we as coaches can understand when we hydrate our athletes, but most importantly, hydrate them after the game as well. Hmm. And most of us don't understand that, and they don't understand the regeneration factor of hydration. The second topic that I'm talking about, which is on January 16th, is really a cardiological concussion update. You know, those are two large topics that we're going to handle in a small, small amount of time. But basically, it's to give coaches an idea and understanding of where we're going in America when it comes to cardiac screening, sudden death injuries on the field, but also understanding an update on concussion where to turn, what to do, and also what is a true return to play. We're going to talk about the closest three states' laws, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, because that's where the convention is in Pennsylvania. So we're going to bring up those three state statues and discuss them a little bit so the coaches understand how to reduce their risk and liability and can return the athletes back to the field of play in a safe manner. Awesome. Well, we're going to wrap up, and uh, Dr. Gluti, thank you so much for all of your knowledge and just taking the time to speak with us today. And for viewers out there, please be sure to register for the NSA convention so you can see Dr. Gallucci's um, presentations in person. As he mentioned, he has two sessions. So one is Thursday, January 15th at 1245, what coaches need to know about preventing lower extremity injuries. And then the other one is Friday, January 16th at 9 a.m., uh, Concussion and Cardiac Update, What Coaches Need to Know. So be sure to register for convention and also just find out what um, other opportunities there are, networking, learning, um, and just celebrating the world's game all in Philadelphia. So uh, be sure to register at nscaa.com. Again, John, thank you again for joining us, and everyone have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Have a great one, and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.